I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. Oops, I'm on the wrong app. Where'd it go? There it is. Sorry about that. We will, as I promised last week, read the passage in just a moment together. Go ahead and find that, and we'll get to it in just a minute, as I promise. All right. When I came here as your pastor 22 years ago, our church did not have a pianist. And we had the world's greatest church organist in Ray Rimmers um, playing for us, so it wasn't like we really needed a pianist at, at that time, because Ray was just incredible on the organ. But we had a piano, so we figured we ought to find somebody who could play it. And I got the, the staff together. We began praying every day that God would bring a pianist to us. And in about six weeks' time, we had three different ladies come to our church who were qualified to play the piano. Um, and I learned a, an important lesson in that, that when... There's a need in the church. You know, obviously we, we pray to God. That, that should be a no-brainer. We should automatically want to do that. But God hears us, and he responds to the prayers of his people and to the needs that we have. And whether it be deacons or Sunday school teachers or pianists or whatever, our God knows our needs. When we lay our prayers before him, he hears us and he delights in taking care of us and answering those prayers. Now, I've been studying revivals since I was in seminary back in the last millennium. And we need to understand that revivals and spiritual awakenings are fully the work of God. I've been trying to teach you that each week. Um, as far as revivals are concerned... Revivals happen basically in two ways. God, who is sovereign, chooses when and to whom he is going to send revival. Now, he's not stingy in the sending of his revival. I believe God wants us to be revived. But sometimes he chooses a church over here or an individual over there or maybe a, a city or community or nation over there. And he sends revival in a mighty way. And maybe we're not involved in that revival. We should not be upset that others are getting revival and we're not. We should rejoice that God is reviving his people regardless of where or to whom he sends it. But revival also occurs when God's people repent of their sins, and seek God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, this is still the work of God. But I believe that one of the ways revival happens, and it's in the second part that I'm talking about right now, that when we seek God, we're going to find him. In fact, his word promises us that. So when we seek him and when we confess our sins and repent and we begin doing the things that God's called us to do that we know we ought to be doing anyways, we start doing those things, God delights in reviving us. Now, um, it's in the second way where God's people get right deal with um, issues in their lives and in their church life uh, that we find God sending revival. So in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 7, we find a problem is happening and the church responds by selecting seven men who are going to be the first deacons. And you've probably have heard me address this passage before when we've done deacon ordination services. Um, it's a very common pa passage for that time. And though we're talking about 
church leaders, and that certainly includes deacons. I don't want us to be focused just on deacons during this, this message. I am talking about all leaders. And quite frankly, folks, you ought to be serving in some leadership position. It doesn't have to be up here on the stage in front of everybody else. You ought to be serving in some way. And even if your position of leadership is simply picking up a paper towel that missed the trash can, that's a leadership role that you can play. God's got a job for all of us. And from this passage of scripture, I'm going to show you some principles that brought revival to this period in the early church and can also lead to revival in our own church today. Stand with me as we read together Acts 6, verses 1 through 7. You ask, why do we stand? We honor the reading of God's word by standing. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. And they had, excuse me, they had then had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Father, we pray that you would take this passage and so shake us to the very core that we could not leave here today without crying out for revival. Lord, we thank you for this passage. Use it now to change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I want to show you four principles from this passage that allow revival to happen. Now, the first principle that we see is that revival can occur when God's people faithfully deal with a problem within the church. Look with me once again at verses 1 and 2. It says this, In those days, as the disciples were increasing in numbers, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said it would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. And we'll stop there. All right? So there's a problem that's happening. There's some widows that are being um, given money to buy food. There are other widows that are not being given money to um, buy food. Um, but like most problems, there's other issues involved. And I want you to notice that the, the Hellenistic Jews, the ones being overlooked, they're griping against the Hebraic Jews, the Jewish widows, because they were getting money in order to be able to buy food. Um, that happens so often. We tend to gripe or complain against the wrong people. You know, if you're involved in some sort of a problem here at church, maybe in your own life, whatever it might be, and you start complaining, make sure you hit the right person. You know, and I'm not saying that we ought to do that anyways, but um, what happens is we gripe and complain against the wrong people who don't have anything to do with it. It wasn't the Hellenistic Jews who were passing out the money. It was somebody else. So we, we tend to gripe against the wrong people. And I want you to understand something, first of all, here, is that um, the early church here was growing. Notice it says in verse 1, um, in those days as the disciples were increasing in numbers. So the church is expanding. It's, it's sharing the good news of Jesus Christ 
and people are responding to the gospel message. And they had a problem. Some widows were getting overlooked. Some were getting money. And I want you to understand something, folks. Problems occur in every kind of church. There is no church exempt from problems. Doesn't matter what denomination the church is. Doesn't matter the size of the church or the size of the budget of the church. Doesn't matter how gifted the preacher is or isn't. There's problems in every church. Now, the, the real issue is not looking for a church that has no problems. The real issue is finding a church that deals with its problems in a godly manner. And I want you to understand that it doesn't matter if, you're, if you have positive problems or you have negative problems in a church. You're still going to have problems, all right? You know, a positive problem might be, you know, where are you going to put everybody? We're growing so fast, we, we don't have room to put everybody, or we don't have parking spaces outside for everybody. Those are the kind of problems we want to have. But then there's also negative problems. People are griping against one another. There's gossiping in the church. People refusing to serve in positions that need to be, need someone in them. You know, there's, there's good problems to have. There's bad problems to have. They're all still problems, though. So what was the problem here in Acts chapter 6? Well, it was pretty pretty simple from our perspective 2,000 years later, but it was very real back in those days. You had widows, and by the way, to be a, considered a widow, it wasn't just that your husband died, but to be a widow, you had to not have sons. And the reason for that is if you had a son, you were expected, ladies, to go move in with the son, and the son would take care of you. But without the son, then you were placed on the widow's list. So here's what's happened. As the church began to grow in Jerusalem, the Jews didn't like it because many of the people coming to faith in Christ in those days were Jewish. And they were, it was a problem. So one of the ways that the early church fought back against the followers of Jesus was that they cut off the widows from the money that they were receiving from the temple. Here's what was happening. If you were a Jewish lady and your husband died, you didn't have any sons, you could go to the temple and receive a little bit of money in order to be able to go out and buy food each day. Um, if you didn't get that money, then you might have to resort to other means to provide for yourself. Uh, one of which might have been the second oldest profession. And as I told the early church or the earlier service, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. Okay. Um, but they didn't want women doing that. So they gave them a little bit of money. They're not going to get rich, but they're going to be able to feed themselves and have a little bit of self-esteem in the process. Well, when the, these widows were beginning to follow Jesus Christ, they were cut off from the money in the temple, and so the early church had to pick up that money, had to pick up that ministry. And so they began to give money to, the, to these widows so that they could go to the markets each day and buy food. Now, the, the question is, how did this happen? Well, we really don't know. It could have been just an accident. Oops, we didn't intend to, but sorry, you got overlooked. It could have been intentional. Um, we don't like Greeks, and though we're not going to give them money, we don't know, and we'd be foolish to, to speculate. But the problem simply was this. The Hebraic widows, the Jewish widows now following Jesus, they were getting money to buy food. That's a good thing. But the Greek widows, the, the Hellenistic widows, according to my, my, my translation, uh, they were not getting money to buy food, and that was a bad thing, all right? So um, what we as a, the lesson we need to learn here at this point simply is this, that the church needs to guard itself against failures 
in ministry or when we minister to others. Now, I hope that we are smart enough that we're not going to intentionally overlook anybody. Oh, you have a need? Great. We'll take care of you. Sorry you got the same need. We don't like you. We're not going to do it. Now, we're not going to do that. But we've got to be wise. We've got to be wise as serpents and as gentle as doves, as Christ said, in, in how we minister to other people. I've said this many times from this pulpit. If you're not dealing with a problem right now in your life, wait five minutes because one's coming around the corner. Problems are a fact of life. You're, you're never going to get away with them or get away from it. But what we as a church body need to do is to be careful how we minister to those who are hurting. To do so in a manner that helps them, that benefits them, but also does not hurt other people. And that's what was happening here. You got the Hellenistic Jews or Jewish widows that were not getting any money, and you got the, the Hebraic Jewish widows who were getting money, and it was just a problem. Okay? As I said, I'll, I'll repeat it again because I think it's so important. The issue is not finding a church that has no problems, the issue is finding a church that deals properly with the problems that it faces. All right? Now, some problems are good kind, some problems are the bad kind, but either way, we as a church need to seek the Lord God whenever we have to deal with somebody's um, hurts or somebody's needs. And that's, that's so critical. You know, if sin is involved in somebody's life, that's why they have have a problem right now, that sin needs to be identified, that sin needs to be dealt with. And we who are helping must do so graciously with love to help other, peop help other people. Now this church is not perfect, and I've never seen one yet that is perfect. God does not call us to have a perfect congregation, but he does call us to be a healing congregation and by that I mean we don't hurt other people intentionally sometimes sadly it happens but we're not to, to pursue that um, the second principle that we see here is the issue of dealing with the problem How, what's the solution and I want you to look with me at verses 3 and 4 Luke continues to write, he says, Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will de devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. All right? Now, what the, the solution should always revolve around spiritual realities. And what I mean by that is that the answers to our problems as a congregation or when we help others is not focused on our own fleshly abilities. I mean, it would be real easy if somebody has a financial need to go find somebody who's got lots of money and they just write a check and pay for it. But that's not the, pro that's not the right way of dealing with it. For you see, spiritual realities revolve around God. And we need to seek not only the leadership of Almighty God when we're helping others, but also when we're dealing with problems in our own life. Now, God has given us principles in his word that needs to be applied to every aspect of our lives. And some, some of these principles in God's word, maybe we don't know and we need to be taught. And that's something that we need to, to help other people do. And let me, by way of example, share with you a little bit more of what I mean by the spiritual realities. Um, first of all, our church needs godly men and women to serve. That should be a no-brainer, but I need to point that out for a couple of reasons. Number one, every single person who is at least, you know, an adult, and we can even include teenagers sometimes in this, should be serving. 
There should be no place, or should be, excuse me, should be nobody who is not serving. You don't have to be a deacon or a Bible teacher. Maybe your service is simply, like I said, picking up a piece of paper that missed the trash can. But we all ought to be serving. But then notice also I said that churches need godly men and women to serve. And the reason why I say that is none of us should stay where we are as Christians. We should always be moving forward or, be, or I should say drawing closer to God in our Christian life. If we are stationary in our spiritual life, chances are we're really backsliding a little bit. We're not growing as we should. So we need godly men and godly women. Now, how do we tell who's godly or not? Well, Luke gives us four ways that we can evaluate other people's spirituality. Now, let me point out, let's be careful here, folks, because we want to be careful against going around and judging everybody. You know, there's Shelley. Does she, is she godly or not? You know, that's not the right way to deal with this. But Jesus does say in the Sermon on the Mount, do not judge lest you be judged. But then the next verse says, for in the same way that you judge. So you see, we are going to be judging whether we like it or not. So let's do it in the right way, all right? And for in the same way you judge, others will judge you is what, he's, what Jesus will say in the full verse. Four things Luke gives us here out of this passage. Number one, um, good reputation among others. All right, this is what Paul, you know, what the, what the twelve are saying when, uh, he, you know, it says verse three, choose seven men of good reputation. Here's the issue: it's not just the reputation of people in the church, because chances are, especially in a church our size, you're going to be liked. If you're not liked, you're probably going to go somewhere else. Okay, what is your reputation though out in the world? What is your reputation in the business world or in your neighborhood? How do outsiders from our local congregation look at you? Now, here's the reason why this is important. If we were to elect, say, as a deacon, a man who is, uh, uh, has a bad reputation, he cheats in his business, he, he kicks his wife and beats his dog, you know, he, he's a lousy individual. That begins to reflect back on us as a congregation because that individual is not living the way he, he's supposed to live. So be, having a good reputation is important, in the, especially in the community. Second thing that Paul or Luke says is uh, the, these seven men need to be full of the Holy Spirit. Now this goes back parallel to what Paul says in Ephesians 5.18 where he says, do not get drunk with wine which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. That is a commandment of, of God. Now here's the thing. When I sin, do I lose a little bit of the Holy Spirit at that time? No. The moment I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I received 100% of the Holy Spirit and I don't lose that 100% at any time during my Christian life. The real question is not how much do I have of the Holy Spirit. The real question is how much of me does the Holy Spirit have. And if I can only give 25% right now, Holy Spirit can use that 25%. But wouldn't it be better if I had gave 50% to God? Or 75% of God, or to God? Well, obviously, to be full means 100%. And that ought to be our goal. That ought to be how we are trying to live our life, that we have humbled ourselves, we have surrendered ourselves to God so that he has full control, full um, obedience from me. This describes the seven men that were selected. They were full of the Holy Spirit. But then the twelve also said, find for us seven men who are full of wisdom. Now, 
Wisdom is not um, how many you know, earned degrees do you have, how many bachelor degrees or master's degrees. That's not the point. Wisdom in the Bible is a knowledge of God's word and then the application of that knowledge into your own life. You can have a Ph.D. in Hebrew and Greek and in theology and have the Bible memorized. But if you don't do what it says, you're not wise. Conversely, you can be illiterate. But if you learn the word of God and do what it says, according to the scriptures, you will be considered wise. So these men need to be um, wise in the application of God's word to their life. And then obviously this Latin, the fourth point is again, it's a no brainer, but I pointed out nevertheless, they need to be willing to serve. For we could have the greatest Christian man who ever walked the earth among us. But if he's not willing to serve, what good is he? Nothing. He is of no value. Now, when wrong people are put into the wrong places of leadership, it normally makes the problems what? Worse. Okay? Okay? You know, if we have a problem in our church, it doesn't do any good just to fill the position. We need to find the right man or the right woman to, to serve. And when we find a godly man or a godly woman and get them into the right position of leadership to serve in our congregation, what do you think that does to God? He's going to put a smile on his face. He's going to look down at elders and say, that church gets it. They understand what they're doing as far as leadership is concerned. And that's where revival begins to, to uh, happen in the local church. Each of us, beginning with me as your pastor, down to the lowliest of members of our church, each of us should work daily to seek the Lord God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Each of us daily should confess our sins and repent of those sins so that we can be right with God. So it doesn't really matter where you are in your Christian life. God's got a place for you to serve. And he wants to use you. He wants to use me. But it's up to us if in order to walk with him or not. Now the third principle that we see in our text is that revival occurs when the right men and right women are placed in the right positions. Now this is a little bit different than dealing with the solution that we just talked about. In verses 5 and 6, Luke wrote this, This proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Now, our text here, as I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon, is dealing with uh, the selection of deacons. But I believe it applies also the principles to all the positions in our church. And so that's why I, uh, this third point I've entitled the right men and women. I'm not going to deal with the issue of women and deacons in this sermon. I've done that many times in the past. And you guys should know how I feel about that. What I want you to understand, though, is that um, we need to recognize that the right man or the right woman needs to be put into the right place of leadership. And there's a place for every one of us. One of the hardest jobs in most churches is the nominating committee. Now we just had a deacon, or excuse me, not deacon, a business meeting this past Tuesday. Praise the Lord, it was the first business meeting we've been able to have since February because of COVID-19. Um, one of the parts of that business meeting 
is the report from the nominating committee. And in that report, they brought various names before the church for different positions. Now, one of the things I do in the kind of the, the back channels of our church is I keep an eye on the nominating committee to make sure that they're praying, to make sure that they're seeking God for those positions that they're trying to fill. But when they come to the business meetings every other month, they bring these names. We as a church body need to pray over those names as well. We don't want to just trust that the nominating committee prayed, though we trust that they do. But all of us need to be praying. All of us need to be seeking God about the deacons and about the Sunday school teachers and about the committee you know, workers and, and, and in every aspect of our church because it's so critical that the right man and the right woman be placed in the right position. Now, Luke gives us a list of the seven men, and he begins with Stephen. Now, in Greek writing, you write or you list the most important person first, and then you go down to, to least, and, and you see that in Paul's writings as well. Um, Stephen is listed first, not because he's the most important man, but because he's going to play an important role in chapter 7 uh, when he is arrested and has to stand before the Sanhedrin and he preaches that beautiful sermon of how God has worked through his people and now uh, he's working through Jesus and then what happens? Stephen gets stoned, stoned to death. And there's a young man holding coats over on the side by the name of Saul who most of us know as the Apostle Paul. So that's Stephen. He's listed first. Luke tells us a couple things about him. First of all, he tells us that he is a man of faith. He's full of faith. What does that mean? Well, being full of faith is a knowledge of God's word and the application of that word to your life. But it also is the trust or belief or faith in God to do what he says. So it varies a little bit between wisdom in that way. Now... When you read a promise of God, do you need to worry that God is going to do that promise or not? Absolutely not. If you read a promise in the scriptures of God's word, you can take it to the bank, folks. God's going to do what he says he's going to do. That's what being full of faith means. That was Stephen. Stephen also was a man full of the Holy Spirit. And what that means goes back to you know, Paul's writing in Ephesians 5, 18. We've already talked about that. I'm not going to spend any more time on that. But Stephen was a man full of the Holy Spirit. Our church desperately needs men and women who are like this. Who are full of faith and full of ho the Holy Spirit. Now the second name that is listed is, is Philip. Now there was an apostle named Philip. But that's not this guy. This guy is the deacon Philip. And in Acts chapter 8, Philip is sent by the Holy Spirit to go witness to a, an Ethiopian eunuch. This man sitting in his chariot reading the, the, the book of Isaiah. He doesn't understand it. Philip goes up to him and in the, the authority of the Holy Spirit explains to him what the passage means. And then the man gives his life to Jesus Christ. We need godly men and godly women who can go, who can follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and share the good news of Jesus Christ with whoever they need to share it with. It might be your next door neighbor. It might be your child or grandchild. It might be a complete stranger as the case is with Philip and this Ethiopian government worker. But that's Philip. Then there's Procurus. We really don't know from the scriptures anything about Procurus. Though we do know from the writings of the church fathers, um, which is kind of a, a commentary on the early church, that Procurus was associated with the, with the apostle John. And some early church historians believe that Procurus was the man who actually wrote down the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, 
as John dictated it to him. Maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, we don't really know. Then there's Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenius, and we don't know anything about these guys. They became deacons on this day, don't know anything else from the scriptures or from history about them. And then there's Nicholas, who was a convert, for, convert from Antioch, meaning uh, Antioch up in Syria. He was a Jewish man who had come, or excuse me, he was a Gentile man who converted to Judaism, and now he's following the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? What I want you to understand is this, that revival does not come through the right man or the right woman. It comes through God. But when the, a local church like our own places the right men and the right women who are godly men and women in the right positions, that is the way that revival can begin in a local church. All right? Revival comes from God, but God is looking for the Christian or the church that is humble, that is surrendered, that is obedient. And if those three words do not um, describe your spiritual life, uh, got good news. God allows you turns. God allows you to change the direction in your life, and you can even change today if you would like to in order to draw closer to him. The fourth principle in our text is found in the very last verse. It's chapter seven, or verse 7, and it's the blessings of God. Look with me what it says. So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. So three things are happening here. First of all, the word of God spread. Now let me explain to you how that happens. When you and I get revived, it's going to change us. We're not going to be the same person we were prior to the revival. We'll be different. We'll be more like what Christ would have us to be. And people are going to see the changes in us. People are going to see that you've got more joy in your life. You've got more peace that you're, you're handling problems in your own life in, in a, a, a strange way that we identify as a godly way. And guess what? People who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ are going to say, what's going on? Why are you different? What's happened? And that's your moment, my friends, when you can share the good news of Jesus Christ that you can explain from the scriptures who this Jesus is that you love and follow. And because of that, the word of God will spread here in Eldersburg or wherever you may be. All right, so that's what's happening in Jerusalem. The word of God spreading because of the revival. Second thing that happens, Luke says, is that the disciples in Jerusalem increase greatly in numbers. In other words, they're having numerical growth. They were having people getting saved. Now, let me point something out. I hope you've already caught on to this. Revival is for the church. Revival is not for the lost. Revival is for God's people, okay? But what happens when God's people get revived is the lost want to know why, want to know how, and they're going to get saved also told you at the very beginning of this message, I've been studying revivals for a long, long time. I hate to say this, but probably about 35 years or more. And one thing that I've seen is that churches will sometimes put out a false word that our church is having revival, but it's not really God's revival. And how do I know that? Well, number one, revival, or the lost are not getting saved. When God's people get revived, you're going to see the lost coming to salvation also. It happens every single time. Now there's another thing that happens when true revival takes place is that there are changes in the community. Let me give you a couple quick examples of this. In the um, Wales revival in Wales, England, back in 1904, to 1906, um, 
that the community of Wales is primarily a coal mining area. Uh, lots of coal in that part of Great Britain. And in those days, they didn't have automated um, carts. They had mule or donkey driven carts or pulled actually. And here's, here's where I was going with this. this is, I love this. After six months of this revival, they had to retrain the donkeys and the mules because the, the men working the mines stopped cussing and the donkeys didn't know what to do. Friends, when revival happens, it affects the community. In, in 1859, right before the Civil War, revival swept this nation. It's the single greatest revival in history. Fully a tenth of our nation got saved during that revival. But what was interesting is that during that time period, police officers didn't have anybody to arrest because there was a drop in crime. And local um, police precincts formed um, uh, barbershop quartets. I don't know if that was the term they used back in those days, but that's what they did. And they rented themselves out to churches. We'll come sing in your church and we'll sing hymns if you'd like to have us come, because they didn't have anybody to arrest. Folks, that's what revival does to communities. Third thing that happened was that the Jewish priests became obedient to the faith. Now, when I first began reading this passage and studying it, I had to scratch my head a little bit. Well, okay, we got numerical growth. It makes sense that priests would get saved. But here's what I think Luke's trying to tell us. Who would have been the hardest group of Jews to reach with the gospel? Been the priests. Why? Because they're descendants of Aaron. They're the men tasked with performing the sacrifices, by, with teaching the law, by maintaining Judaism, which was the core of the Jewish people. And they're not going to likely or lightly change. But what was happening was these Jewish priests were coming to salvation. And what that means basically is this, that there is no group beyond the reach of God. There is no organization, no, no single individual who is so hard-hearted, so out of reach that God can't save them. You might know somebody in your life that, that that's that way. You might have a brother or a sister, a child, a grandchild, or a, maybe even a parent whose heart is so hardened you think they're never going to come to salvation in Jesus Christ. Not so, my friends. Not so. God can reach anybody. But he is looking for men and women, boys and girls, who are sold out 100% to him who seek God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and confess our sins and repent of our sins daily. That's the kind of person God sends revival to. That's the kind of church God sends revival to. And that's the kind of person God works through to reach hard people. Friends, if you know of anybody like that in your life, God may be waiting for you to get revived. To reach them. Steve, would you come up and get ready for the invitation? Before he sings, I want to give you one more thing to think about. Have you ever seen, either in person or on the news, a house fire? Hopefully it wasn't your house. But we've all seen buildings burn. It's not going to be too many more weeks that the temperatures will be cool enough that we'll be able to put a log in the fire and Start a fire and watch it burn. Folks, there's just something about watching something burn that, that attracts us. Well, think about this spiritually. When you and I are on fire for God, people are going to want to watch us burn. Not in physical flames that consume our bodies, but in a a spiritual sense, when we are on fire for God, it's going to get other people's attention.